this image, as we're looking at it, what we're seeing is not just all the galaxies, but there's a cluster here. And, you know, it's really, there's so much detail here. We're seeing these galaxies in a way that we've never been able to see before. I'm still wrapping my head around it. Galaxies showing up during the so-called dark ages simply shouldn't happen. Before Webb even launched, we published predictions about what it ought to observe, and then the data came back and contradicted us. First Webb images released were of the Southern Ring Nebula. This is a planetary nebula, which is a star at the very end of its life. That moment mattered. It meant we'd learned something real. What we learned, bluntly and beautifully, is that our physics was wrong. And that's not a failure. That's the thrill of science. Being wrong in a way that forces you to rethink everything is exactly how progress happens. To understand why this is so unsettling, you have to rewind to the beginning. Right after the Big Bang, the universe was a violent stew of matter and energy. No stars, no galaxies, no structure at all, just raw ingredients. As space expanded, everything slowly cooled, and only then could matter begin clumping together strongly enough to ignite stars and eventually assemble galaxies. There was a crucial milestone along the way. For the first several hundred thousand years, light couldn't travel freely. It was constantly bouncing off charged particles, turning the universe into an opaque haze. Around 400,000 years after the Big Bang, expansion thinned that fog, and light was finally released. But even then, there was nothing producing new light. That long, quiet stretch, after light could move freely but before the first stars ignited, is what we call the Dark Ages. No glowing objects, no signals calling out across space, just the faint afterglow of the Big Bang itself fading into silence. Using everything we thought we understood, gravity, quantum mechanics, nuclear fusion, we ran the numbers, carefully, confidently. Our best estimates said it should take roughly one to two billion years for stars to form in meaningful numbers, and longer still for enough of them to gather into a galaxy bright enough to be seen across the cosmos. Individual stars would be nearly impossible to detect from such distances. That framework shaped our view of the early universe. We knew our understanding was incomplete, so we asked a bold question. What if we built a telescope powerful enough to watch galaxies being born? That question became the blueprint for the next great observatory after Hubble. We designed it with one goal, to peer back to the moment when the Dark Ages ended and the first cosmic structures lit up the universe. That telescope became the Webb Telescope. Webb was engineered differently for a reason. Newborn galaxies should blaze with energy, dominated by hot, massive stars that flood space with intense ultraviolet radiation. If our theories were right, Webb would catch the universe just as those first lights switched on. What it found instead is why we're still trying to understand. So how do we even see these galaxies today? After all, they formed unimaginably long ago, and the universe hasn't stood still since then. It's been stretching. As space expanded, the light those early objects emitted was stretched with it. The fierce ultraviolet glow produced in the young universe has, over 13.8 billion years, been pulled into much longer wavelengths. What was once ultraviolet now arrives to us as infrared. We understood this in theory, but there's still something magical about turning that knowledge into a trick that actually works. In a sense, we outsmart the cosmos. We built the Webb Telescope with extraordinary sensitivity to infrared light, the same light that began its journey as ultraviolet shortly after the universe's first stars ignited. We power it on, point it outward, and suddenly the past comes into view. That choice gives Webb another superpower too. Infrared light can slip through dense clouds of gas and dust that block visible light. Right in our cosmic backyard, stars are being born inside these thick veils. With ordinary light, they're completely hidden. Everything scatters and you see nothing. Infrared cuts through the mess. The stars shine through, their locations snap into focus, and even newborn planets circling them start to reveal themselves. 
So Web isn't just a time machine, it's a universal tool. It peers into nearby stellar nurseries with the same ease that it peers back toward the dawn of the universe. And when we tuned it specifically to catch galaxies in their infancy, that's when things got truly strange. We started finding fully formed galaxies where there should have been none, right in the middle of the Dark Ages. No one was ready for that. The shock was so intense that the lead researcher reportedly spat out his coffee the moment he grasped what the data was saying. Suddenly, we're faced with unsettling possibilities. Maybe we don't understand how galaxies form at all, which, to be fair, is precisely why we built Webb in the first place. But everything we thought we knew about matter and energy insists that the Dark Ages had to exist. Something fundamental must have changed. That means we may need to go back and rewrite parts of the story, even if we don't yet know how. Or perhaps something entirely unfamiliar formed back then. Objects unlike any we've ever seen, able to arise effortlessly in a supposedly empty era. Or maybe the problem lies with our timeline itself, and these objects don't belong in the Dark Ages at all. Right now, our conclusions are based mostly on images, on how these objects look and how bright they appear. That's not enough. What we truly need is a spectrum. And I'll be careful with the word galaxy, because these things may turn out to be something else entirely. A spectrum is like a cosmic fingerprint. Think of a rainbow. Sunlight passes through raindrops and splits into colors. Look closer, and those colors tell you what the sun is made of, the elements burning inside it. Push the analysis further, and you can even learn how fast it's spinning. That's what we're waiting for now. The moment those spectra arrive, the universe may finally tell us what these mysterious objects really are, and why they showed up long before they were ever supposed to exist. Once you have a spectrum in hand, the universe starts giving up its secrets. From it, we can tell exactly what these objects are made of, and we can pin down their distances with far greater confidence. That matters because there's a real chance our current estimates are being fooled by something subtle. Maybe some effect is skewing the measurements. Maybe these objects aren't buried deep in the Dark Ages after all, but are actually hovering near its boundary, only appearing more distant than they truly are. Or, as people often jump to when faced with the unfamiliar, maybe it's aliens. If that's where your mind goes first, fine, I won't stop you. But in science, that's the final card we play, not the opening move. And to be fair, this exact kind of mystery is why we built the telescope in the first place. Webb exists to help us understand how galaxies come into being. And whenever you create a new instrument that lets you explore parts of the universe we've never accessed before, new eras, new environments, new extremes, it does two things. It sharpens what you already thought you understood, and then, inevitably, it blindsides you with discoveries no one could have predicted. That surprise, that shock, is the true beauty of frontier science. So when you see headlines claiming scientists are abandoning their favorite theories or scrambling back to the drawing board, understand this, we never left it. The drawing board is where science lives. Revising ideas isn't a crisis, it's the process. Discovery means standing with one foot planted in what we know, and the other stretched into territory we haven't explored yet. And as our knowledge expands, so does the boundary of what we don't know. The unknown doesn't shrink, it grows with us. That's why, in science and in life, you learn to cherish the questions, not dread them. You learn to welcome uncertainty, not run from it. And that's really what's going on here.